Hello everyone, this is Shumaldo coming to you from Zero Dollar Security. Welcome to the second video on the course of malware development. In the first video, we discussed a bit about the different types of malwares out there in the market. If you haven't checked it out, pause the video, go check out that and come back here. You would need some prerequisites from that video to understand this one. And if you are done with that, let's get started. So here we're going to learn about some very famous malwares that in fact have become legends in this field. And we we'll take a journey through both the offensive and in some way the defensive. Malwares over the ages have evolved from some naive malwares like creepers on the ARPANET to Stuxnet that prevented wars. So the course of malware development is really important if you are seriously planning on building your own malwares. It would give you a sense of inspiration from where to start with and also show you how concepts some of which we use in today's malwares got its origins from. Some of you might be asking, why should we at all bother about stuff that's obsolete and no longer in use? Yeah, if you try to use code which was used to build these malwares, which we'll see in the course, none of them would help you build something successful or would help you build something groundbreaking. But then why bother learning about it? Is it customary? Will it be helpful? And how would it help you? For a start, let's understand that even though these codes have been recognized and well documented, some methods these malwares have used are still used in advanced malwares that are coming up today. Stuff like polymorphism. And throughout this journey you will see how not only the defensive but the offensive have evolved in a fashion so as to bring out the best and the worst within each other. As a red teamer, your objective should be to expose the flaws of the system or the structure, the organization that you are given a task to infiltrate. Now, you would see through this course how each malware was detected, patched, and how the next one learned not to do the same mistake, and how the next antivirus learned to even get better than the malware that came before it. So it's really a competition and this thing still continues today. Even today there's a competition between red teamers and antivirus companies. They come with techniques to uh, recognize such malicious code and people end up coding in ways these antivirus softwares would fail to detect. So this is really a competition that's been going on, this kind of a rivalry and you'd see how that rivalry had evolved through the ages and some of it might be helpful while you are scripting your own malware. Of course, the source code for most of the malware that I would be showing you is available. I have tried my best to collect it from sources and I have added links in description. I would also give you ad additional resources so as to really understand these malwares in great detail if you find any particular one interesting and 
though these quotes again in their original form may not be useful concepts in these quotes are today used to may to give malware's features and to really show the operation of these uh, fensive so as to say softwares in a system now i have been using the word malwares throughout the course uh, here we would mostly be dealing with worms and viruses you would know these from the previous video uh, we would also discuss a bit about ransomware at a very later part of the video but most for for the history uh, most malwares have been worms trojans and viruses and uh, you'd see that i often use the word viruses but really it's it's the journey of malware throughout uh, we would see how naive worms like creeper slowly evolved into malware like stuxnet that eventually would be quite important in both uh, the history of cybercrime as well as the history of the world so as to say so let's dive into it the first malware to hit syst the systems uh, at that point was named creeper it was uh, first discovered in 1971 and it's said to have spread through something called the arpanet now the arpanet is a predecessor of the internet um, it's something like the internet but something very uh, primitive and uh, yeah it involves some concepts of networking but uh, most of it is not used today so uh, uh, the source code of creeper was written in machine level language most of it is lost even if it existed it was for those specific unix machines at that time and you'd really not find it helpful but creeper was something that programmers at that time thought would not be practical but Quite interestingly, the idea of something like uh, the creeper virus could be found far back in John von Neumann's paper, Self-Replicating Automata. I'd add the link to the paper in the description below. Feel free to check it out. It's quite interesting to know that von Neumann on whose name we call the von Neumann architecture was also in a way the father of malware and cybercrime but yeah that was only a theoretical paper written back then until 1971 no one thought that a program like that would even be possible but creeper was in a way a crack in the wall it showed uh, programmers at the time developers people who'd really be using computers back then mostly for scientific purposes as we know that uh, the creeper worm didn't affect a lot of domestic pcs they were not in use back then but yeah it showed developers that the paper of john von neumann could actually be put to use and it could be coded and Creeper was actually patched by another worm called Reaper, which was released on the ARPANET. And it didn't cause much havoc. The Creeper payload was a simple text. You, you can see that text on the slide. And really, uh, that's, that's about it. The Creeper didn't use any sophisticated techniques to travel around the ARPANET. The ARPANET was not a very protected environment the arpanet didn't consist of authentication uh, as secure as would be necessary when the internet was in place but yeah it actually showed that there could be a program that could make copies of itself and really spread out over a connected network without much of human interference so yeah 
the worm reaper released by a person who was involved in the development of the creeper worm would eventually destroy it. That's the first documented case of a malware attack in a system. With that, we come really to the generation of malwares which we recognize as the real first generation viruses. Now, a very interesting thing is that though uh, several people disagree on which was the first virus attack on a system uh, which could be class which could be recognized as the first virus the animal game which was released for the unix system had an interesting subroutine which was called pervade which in a way stands out to be the first subroutine which could be identified as a full model virus. Now, as we discussed in the previous video, when we discussed different types of malwares, a virus is essentially a program that copies itself into other files in the computer. Uh, remember, it's different from a worm. A worm would only spread over the internet or the, the network, it won't really go on affecting things which are not connected to the network. It won't affect a lot of file systems. It won't push itself into other files or copy itself within the computer as much as it would copy itself within a network. You can't get affected by a worm if you're not connected to some network. But yeah, animal would spread through something at that time which could be related to storage devices. So the animal game was released by John Walker and it's uh, the first time something malicious in this was discovered was back in 1975. and. What was it in a sense? Let's understand. So the pervade subroutine copied this game animal into all the files that were accessible by the user. So say your computer had four files or four folders to be more uh, specific. Uh, this subroutine would make a copy of the game in all of the available folders which you have access to. Now, your folders would at that time be present on tapes or storage devices at that time which were used to load the computer. Now, if you take the tape from a computer which had the animal game, and put it on another computer which didn't have the game. Here, animal would again copy itself into all the storage devices that were available on the next computer. So it would really spread as tapes were being shared, and this is quite analogous to a full model virus. And again, animal was not in any way um, malicious designed with a malicious intent uh, John Walker merely released pervade as a way of distributing this game in multiple unique systems and I have added the source code of pervade in the description it's really written in machine level language but if you're interested to understand um, the original source code, um, you want to go through it, feel free to do so. Uh, you'd you, have, you would have to adhere strictly to the Unix machine level code systems that were available back then for Unix systems in 1975. If you want some reference, go 
through the instruction sets which were available for the operating system back then um, and that's about with the animal game or the pervade subroutine the subroutine would eventually be deemed useless after a patch of the Unix system was released the patch would eventually modify the original source tables and thus uh, the subroutine would naively just look around for these tables with uh, a particular name and when the patch was released and that really the file structure table changed the subroutine could no longer identify the storage devices that were present and hence would eventually be obsolete but this really showed the effect a program like this could have and if used in the wrong way could have effects which were devastating the first virus to hit computers which were used in homes was perhaps the elk cloner now apple 2 was a famous pc which was used all across america and this wasn't a pc that was found uh, in offices only this was found in people's houses and at that point we didn't have the internet so the virus the elk cloner would spread through floppy disks that were shared between users now the elk cloner stands out as a boot sector virus much like the pervade subroutine in animal the boot sector virus didn't rely on system table names to copy itself to various f folders in the computer rather it would utilize something that every floppy disk had remember animal spread strictly on tapes that were used for storage now tapes were not very sophisticated uh, solid state devices they were pretty big roles which were used to share data as a very primitive way of doing so but floppy disks which were used in the Apple II were much more sophisticated and had a clean structure one part of the floppy disk which was existent in every working floppy disk was the boot sector the part of the floppy disk that would open up when the floppy disk was inserted there was no doubt that if a floppy disk was functional it would have a boot sector and Dell cloner really found a vulnerability in this boot sector and it put itself on the boot sector of infected floppy disks the payload again was not harmful at all it was a small poem i've put that on the slide and you could see that this somehow had evolved from the pervade subroutine now into something which could be applicable to any floppy disk so the l cloner really was the first major viral attack which was structured in a way to evade something and learn from a mistake that a previous virus had made around the same time uh, in 1986 an interesting experiment was conducted by the company brain in Pakistan this would be known as the brain virus like the L cloner the brain virus is also a boot sector virus it was found in the boot sector of infected floppy disks this would also spread with floppy disks which were shared among people by the way floppy disks uh, were shared among people mostly for pirated software so this system of sharing disks 
for uh, pirate softwares was called SneakerNet. And before the internet, viruses spread with physical floppy disks on the sneaker net. And the brain virus was essentially an experiment to track software piracy. Now, the brain virus again wasn't a harmful payload, was a naive text message that would appear on the person's screen with a phone number and address given of the brain company. And like the elk cloner, when some program written in Pakistan was found in Los Angeles in America on the other side of the world, this showed people how dangerous a virus like this could get even without the existence of internet just spreading through floppy disks that travel around the world with people. And with that, in 1988, at the time of the inception of the internet, we come to the most interesting attack on in the cyber uh, world, so as to say the first crack in the ceiling, the Morris Worm breakout. Until now, all the viruses we have dealt with, all the worms we have dealt with, were pretty harmless. They, they didn't do any damage. They were mere experiments to show people that this was in fact possible. But the Morris Worm, though initially also not written with a malicious intent, would prove devastating. For a major number of computers that were connected to the internet, at that time. So the Morris worm was the first virus which was in a way intelligent. Again, nothing in the brain virus or the elk cloner was very very intelligent in design. Yeah, sure it used the boot sector of a floppy disk. It's pretty neat an idea if you are dealing with uh, pirate software or or but of or stuff that's being shared around by people but with the conception of the internet we had authentication systems that had come up to enter a network now you not only needed the address you needed a password and the morris worm in a way was the first virus to its first malware, so as to say, to perform something called a dictionary attack. Now, the way Morris Worm worked was very interesting. It would be present on a computer, it would scan the available hosts at that point of time, it would try a list of common passwords with each host try to authenticate and if authenticated replicate itself on the next computer but this is just uh, it is a, it's a bit intelligent using a dictionary attack but what was more fatal was that this also used a technique which is a preventive measure so as to evade or nullify effects of an antivirus. Now, though antiviruses had not been conceived much during that time, the creator of the Morris Worm, Robert Morris, thought of a system which would fool his worm in a network. If he had designed this worm in such a fashion, that once a computer was infected, it would not reinfect it, then perhaps he thought people could gimmick this, people could manipulate their systems so as to put up a flag which somehow 
showed the Morris worm that their machine was already infected. And this way people would be able to fool the worm and not get it uh, on the machine even though they really didn't have a copy of the Morris worm. So what he did was he chose a chance reinfection. If the Morris worm found it itself on another machine, one out of seven times it would choose to reinfect that machine. And for the 60,000 computers that were that time connected on the internet, this number was very, very large. After a day or two of the, of the release of the worm, around 10% of the internet at that time, around 6,000 computers, completely shut down. They had thousands and thousands of copies of the Morris worm, and this is shut down and major corporate organizations at that time which were connected to the internet lost a good amount of money in this process. This was the first attack on systems connected to the internet and also the first attack which would result in a conviction. Robert Morris was the first developer to be convicted under the Computer Fraud Act in the US for a cyber crime that related to malware. The code is written in C. I have added the GitHub repository of the code in the description below. If you want to check out the Morris Worm code, please do so and you would find it interesting in a way as to both the concepts that the worm used one was of a dictionary attack and the second was selective reinfection now a dictionary attack is even used today by various malwares and selective reinfection has been documented in internet worms that have come after the Morris worm. Now, the Morris worm really sparked the development of antivirus programs. Programs which would recognize malicious code on a system, inform the user, and try to remove it. And now viruses had to evade these antivirus programs in a way as to be effective and deliver the payload not being detected by the antivirus at the same time. One of the first techniques used by antivirus softwares was detecting code signature. And with that comes one technique to evade detect detection of code signature, code polymorphism. Several viruses uh, like the 1206 virus would infect each system with a code that was different from the other. It would in a way encrypt its infection. So Antivirus softwares, which were on the lookout, could not detect a consistent code signature that they could classify as malicious. Uh, of course, this was related to the way antiviruses back then signed code or understood code signature. With the development of antiviruses later and better processes of identifying code, code, code polymorphism in a way could be tackled and yeah it's it's something of debate as to what uh, are the perfect parameters of code polymorphism and some advanced malware even today use code polymorphism so if you're gonna script your own malware you might want to add this feature to it 
Another very popular technique that's even used today was the concept of activation dates. Now, ma now softwares which were used to detect malware would be on the lookout to, in a way, uh, find suspicious and malicious activity on a system. They would usually do this when a new program had entered the system, monitor its behavior for some time, and classify it as safe or unsafe. A way to go around this was a special activation date for each malware and any time before the activation date, the virus would be present on the system, perhaps would replicate itself, but would not deliver its payload. And Michelangelo, Friday the 13th, are two viruses of this kind which use activation dates um, as a loop around for antivirus evasion. Now comes a next generation of viruses. Viruses which were associated with a dropper, the conception of a vector or a dropper in a malware. And the very first example that comes to my mind are the macroviruses that were conceptualized during this time. Now, in Word or MS Word, macros are small pieces of Visual Basic code which are used for automation and uh, used to perform some tasks within the document developers soon realized that the same could be used to script malicious code and ship it up with well a harmless document over the internet the i love you virus is a famous mass mailing virus which would come with the associated docs file which would have an embedded macro and this would in a sense again create a havoc over the internet uh, sending out a lot of these uh, infected document files and really showing people that a vector which looked harmless like well document file could be used to mask viruses and malware and trick people into executing them on the system. People are more prone, in fact, to download and open Word documents and PDFs as attachments rather than open executables. When you are scripting your own malware, keep this in mind as to how your malware would be delivered to the target system. Macros are a very good way of understanding a vector or a dropper that is associated with a complex malware. These are this, the way malwares had evolved. Uh, now with the internet, macroviruses in 1998 or 2000 were much on the rise and several viruses like concept and i love you i've discussed it yeah so they relied on two things they relied on social engineering in a way which is also a very important concept even today in malwares which is to trick people into opening documents that look legitimate or spark human curiosity into opening them only to end up with an infected system. 
Now coming to the next generation of malware, the blaster worm in 2003 and the santi worm in 2004. Now you'd notice that all the previous generation of malwares used some kind of human interference and social engineering to spread. For example, the mac macroviruses would require a person to download a document file from a curious email and open it in order for the virus to execute. The elk cloner would require floppy disks being shared from one machine to another. Now, the blaster worm in 2003 was the first worm on the internet which could spread practically without any human interference. This used a native vulnerability that existed in Windows at that point of time. On the other hand, the Sandy worm used a vulnerability in PHP. And the Sandy worm, in fact, spread through Google searches. It would pop up in so Google searches and uh, when the person would click the website the malware would get executed so in a way this uh, expanded on the type of vectors that can be used to infect systems by a malware and both of them are unique and innovative in their own ways you can read about them on the internet, I provide links in the description if you want to know more about them. Coming to the most famous malware of the era, that's the Stuxnet in 2010. The Stuxnet malware was developed as a joint project by the Israeli intelligence forces and the NSA in the US. The primary target was to sabotage the Iranian nuclear program at that time. Now, you could read a lot about it on the internet. There are a lot of uh, theories behind the Stuxnet malware, but uh, in a nutshell, Iran was developing on the nuclear program and working on nuclear enrichment in a way that posed a threat to the US government. Things had gone so bad that US and Iran were almost on the brink of war. And to prevent such political tensions, Stuxnet was perhaps the first virus to be used as a cyber weapon by a country officially developed by a government agency. Stuxnet would eventually sabotage the Iranian nuclear program, bring down the reactors to the knees, shut several of these down without a single loss of human life, cripple the Iranian program, and in a way prevent war between two countries. So you can see that malwares play a pretty significant role in world history and in the way for wars are fought uh, in a more modern world without uh, ammunition but behind desks with weapons like these used by countries against each other. Even today there are a lot of groups operating from Russia, from the US, from North Korea, China which are actively identified as groups which are hired by the government or within the government that make cyber weapons to sabotage another country. This is an interesting uh, path of development in malwares and you can read a lot about this Stuxnet virus and on the internet I would add some links in the description. Stuxnet is the basis of the malwares which would come after this, which was really uh, consists of multiple techniques and multiple uh, features 
from previous malwares like polymorphism and it, it, techniques it would use to evade antiviruses and Stuxnet was a great success by the US NSA and you should probably read a lot about it to understand as to how advanced malware should look like in case you're interested in scripting one. Now we come to the most recent versions of malwares that are in use, ransomwares. The most famous attack of a ransomware is perhaps the WannaCry attack in 2017. WannaCry is a ransomware that's developed by North Korea. During the WannaCry attack, several computers across the globe saw their data encrypted by this malware that spread over the internet and this malware demanded a Bitcoin payment in order to decrypt the data on the machine. Now, today antivirus softwares come with ransomware protection to detect the presence of ransomware on a machine and WannaCry really showed the world how dangerous such an attack could be. WannaCry is estimated to cause a loss of millions of dollars and really it's the most recent and the most uh, one of the most rather significant malware attacks of recent times and in a way to show you what uh, leverage a computer program can have over an entire industry or perhaps the entire world. So we have come a long way from the naive creeper virus which just spread a piece of text over the ARPANET to WannaCry which crippled a lot of corporate industries across the globe and demanded money in order to decrypt information. So something as naive as an experiment on a paper by John New von Neumann translated many years later into something that would give billions and billions of dollars to the creators of WannaCry and also cause huge financial losses for the same when a system is infected by such malwares. So this brings us to the end of the journey of the evolution of malware through ages and really the next generation of malwares i discuss one next generation malware in the next video it is hammer toss by the russian group apt29 perhaps this is not an existing class of malware or existing uh, uh, section of history as uh, these kinds of malwares are still in the research stage and massive attacks have not been identified with malwares like Hamatos but I have more or less showed you the documented varieties and documented legends of the malware industry that have had notable impacts on various corporate organizations in the next video, we talk more about experimental malware, which perhaps is the new way to think viruses. And you would use a lot of antivirus evasion techniques and in a way learn a new evasion technique, which would uh, help you script something in your own malware if you want to learn from it. And I hope this video has showed you or rather inspired you in what you should or should not do while making a malware or thinking of a malware uh, when you're planning to program one and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.